My opinion is that China's Latin America strategy should be similar to what Russia's current strategy is with Iran. The potential growth opportunity of Latin America is far above that of the United States today. However, Latin America lacks nuclear weapon, lacks uranium enriched facility. This is why the United States can get to maintain its hegemony over the region. If the United States faced the same problem like China, surrounded by countries and neighbors, many even have nuclear weapons, then the United States will not have the capability to interrupt in the affairs in East Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, our search for the Chinese John Mearsheim is finally over. Introducing to you, Professor Chen Ping. He's an economist and physicist in Fudan University, the same university where Professor Shen Yi came from. He's definitely、uh, from a previous older generation, so maybe Professor Chen is the mentor of、uh, Professor Sun. And <laughs> it's fun how all of the U.S. hawks in China are originated from, you know, Fudan University, which I've been to Fudan University many times for medical projects. Oh, also, Professor Chen、uh, appears very often in Chinese、uh, national TV, so his narratives are also somewhat backed by the Chinese government. Today I'm gonna show you guys an interview of Professor Chen, in which he talked about the upcoming U.S. election and also his opinion on China's foreign policy. Let's take a look. According to your understanding, between these two candidates, which one of them become president will benefit China more? This is a very good question from the perspective of Chinese leadership. There are many difficulty China will face in the coming years. So to answer your question, it depends on what China's priority should be. If the priority of China is the peaceful unification of Taiwan, then I believe Donald Trump becoming president will favor China's position more. Why? Because Donald Trump's goal is to cleanse the American establishment deep state. And the American deep state is the governing power of America during the Cold War era between the United States and the Soviet Union. If Trump insists on cleansing and purging the deep state, the biggest beneficial factor to China will be greatly improving the chance of peaceful unification, unification without war. This is because Taiwan get to pursue. A pro-independent policy due to after the Korean War, the United States muddled in China's domestic affairs. I'm referring to Taiwan, and on this issue, only Donald Trump has the political leverage to negotiate with China, sacrificing Taiwan. No one in the Democrat Party has such leverage. However, if China's priority is to maintain stability. Kamala Harris winning will be preferred. This is because China is undergoing a economic structural transformation, and is facing a lot of hardship right now. Even though during this economic war, China has advanced in its core technology to substitute Western technology, you have to understand that after China entered the globalization trend. China's growth model is utilizing the Western market to satisfy Western demand, export a large amount of industrial products. In exchange, we receive currency like U.S. dollar, in theory, like an empty check. In which case, it might be worthless pretty soon. This kind of growth model is unsustainable. But if we aim to change the economic model, it would take time. And patient. So in this case, Kamala Harris should be more preferred president for China. Their victory will likely provide another four years of stability for China to make the adjustment. Professor Chen, you just said that Trump is aiming to do something that no other president has done before—to openly challenge the American deep state. 
If Trump really managed to become president again, what other obstacle, in your opinion, in the U.S. domestic politics will challenge Trump's leadership? Can you give us some example? I think the biggest uncertainty with Donald Trump is that he's promising too much. I mean, look at him. He said he will cleanse the deep state. Then he found out that the people who run his security team belong to the deep state. I think there are a bunch of political elites and business elite in the United States who want to take out Donald Trump and protect their own business interests. So I think this is one of the biggest uncertainty, because he openly announced his objective. I guess he's forced to do that as well, because if he does not win the battle against the deep state, the deep state will ruin his whole family business and his legacy. So for Trump, this is a battle for survival. Because of this fight for survival, it will lead to unimaginable results. For example. He will strike deals with other countries' leaders, leaders that hold true power in their own country, and offer a political exchange. I think he's most looking forward to strike a deal with the Russian President Putin, and also with other leaders such as Kim Jong Un and Xi Jinping. The trade, I believe, is negotiable between Xi Jinping and Trump. This will be for United States to sacrifice Taiwan in exchange for stability along its southern border. Many Trump supporters are against the current U.S. border policy, and China is a country that can do the most in helping U.S. in securing that border. In addition, Russia can also establish military alliances with old partners such as Cuba and Venezuela. To redirect the attention of U.S. away from China and Russia directly. In addition, this will help Latin American countries to resist against U.S. aggression. So, what I said above are ways that can help Trump in cleansing the deep state and at the same time offer a window for China to unify peacefully with Taiwan. Okay, wait, wait. Can you explain why China can help U.S. In securing the southern border, I don't really get it. The answer is simple. There's currently a wave of anti-U.S. sentiment in Latin America. Also, Latin America's growth opportunities far greater than that of Middle East and Africa. If Latin America countries want to grow and stay prosper after that growth, they need to rely on China. They might hope that China can transfer some of the protection capacity from China to Latin America. However, this is something I'm rather against, because if China transfers the protection capacity to Latin America, China will face the same problem the U.S. is facing today, causing China's economy to deindustrialize and hollow out. That's why I support China's. Policy in transferring the manufacturing capacity from coastal cities to inland cities. My opinion is that China's Latin America strategy should be similar to what Russia's current strategy is with Iran. The potential growth opportunity in Latin America is far above that of the United States today. However, Latin America lacks nuclear weapons, nuclear. Enrichment facilities. This is why the United States gets to maintain hegemony over the region. If the United States face the same problem like China, surrounded by countries and neighbors, many even have nuclear weapons, then the United States will not have the capability to interrupt in the affairs in East Asia. So I believe the long-term China foreign policy relating to the U.S. It's not to promote peaceful coexistence, because the United States will not coexist peacefully with China. So we need to promote China, helping the Latin America countries first to build uranium and rich facilities, build nuclear power plants. This is a peaceful collaboration, right? Then we need to help Latin America to gradually upgrade their conventional weapons, allow them. 
the capability to resist against U.S. bullying. Then, we can consider transfer some industrial capacity and build infrastructures in Latin America. But the precondition of that is Latin America need to have stable political structure, resistant to U.S. influence and muddling, and to stop U.S. muddling in Latin American politics. China need to turn them towards the path of Iran. So remember, first step is to give them unreached uranium capability. Second step is to allow them to develop nuclear weapon to counter against U.S. aggression. If larger countries like Brazil and Argentina become truly independent and able to resist against U.S. and U.K. military imperial aggression, that way Latin America will have the freedom to grow. So to negotiate with the Americans, it's all about trade and leverage. If you want to conduct effective diplomacy when dealing with the United States, you need to create your own leverage. I know there is risk involved here for potential conflict, but I believe the risk is manageable. So we can't be just trying to convince the Americans to take a peaceful path, but we need to show American that we are not a sheep. We are not sheep that's trying to negotiate with a wolf. We need to show the Americans that we are not sheep. We are herd of ox, ox with pointy horns. Sheep can only eat grass, but ox can fight back if provoked. So now it's not the time to sing a song that we Chinese love to hear, a song of peace, but to sing a song that Americans fear. Sing the song they are afraid to listen. Okay, I swear I tried to translate that as accurately as possible, and it sounds very theatrical. I, I know, but okay, let's talk about what he just said here in this short interview. Okay, let's talk about Trump versus Harris first. Okay, I conducted a small survey among my own Chinese friends and relatives, uh, and these people are either educated abroad or they travel abroad frequently. Okay, so they're not. You know, Chinese who never been outside of China, and this is the results. Okay, I, according to my statistic here, roughly seventy percent of my friends and relatives they support Trump, and only about thirty percent support either Harris or they say that they really don't know. Let me let me show you guys some of the things they say here. Okay, so let me show you guys. This guy is from Hong Kong, my friend, and he said that. Well, maybe Trump because under the Democrats, Hong Kong is basically dead. This other friend of mine, I asked, he said that well, the whole world support Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about that. And this friend said that okay, Trump, of course, he might be all in to help Israel. So I asked him if you are pro Israel. So he said that no, and <laughs> because the more resources USA. In sending Israel, the less pressure in Southeast Asia and Taiwan. That's in from his perspective. So I guess that make logical sense. Yes. Here I asked another friend, and he said that well, he's not sure who he want to become president, but he believed that Trump might get another assassination attempt. These next two guy, they both support Trump. Oh, we have a Harris here. This friend of mine from Shenzhen supported Harris because, well, he's running business with United States at the moment, so he probably don't want to get those tariff. Oh, this lady here, he supported Harris because he believes it is too old. He want a woman to become president. So, like I said, most of my friends support Trump at the moment. Now, if you look at the political commentators,、uh, professors, and business elites, most of them at the moment is leaning towards Trump as well. Let me break it down as to why. Okay, business elites first. The people that do business with. United States, yes, I would say that they are leaning towards Harris because between Trump and Harris, Trump will probably enforce higher tariffs towards Chinese business. However, for the people who do business in other country, they actually prefer Trump. 
because Trump's economic tax warfare is universal, not only towards China. So if Trump push forward an aggressive agenda like that, places like you know Europe will have more breathing room to deal freely with China. Harris policy, which is a U.S. you know establishment deep state policy, is to rally allies to contain China together, to surround China and to alienate China. So that is a much more difficult tactic for China to engage against, which then lead to the politicians and geopolitical commentators. These people, almost all of them, are pro-Trump at the moment. Okay, as I just said, it is easier to deal with a U.S. separately, okay, than a U.S. who try to alienate. Uh, Europe and Japan and South Korea, for example, away from China. Plus, Harris and ruling establishment will likely pursue more, I would say, sinister tactics like regime change, the entire Southeast Asia to force it to break away its trade relationship with China. So that's much more difficult for Chinese to handle and fight against. Trump, from their point of view, will focus more on. U.S. domestic issues and give China more breathing space around the globe. So yes, in summary, the political business elites in China, majority of them are pro-Trump at the moment. But only at the moment. If Trump actually get elected, I guess we are not sure exactly what will happen. So let's see. Now onto the topic of militarily support the Latin America countries to help them get nuclear weapons and conventional weapons against the United States. Uh, there was a time in which my understanding of U.S. imperialism towards Latin America was, I would say, more straightforward and also more shallow. Right now, I would say that. Yeah, it is not that simple. It is much more than just military dominance over the area. I think the preferred strategy of China towards Latin America should be the following. Okay, let Russia take the lead in terms of arming Latin America or militarily backing government and regimes there. China should promote and encourage trade with Latin America outside of the U.S. dollar. To eventually help Latin America to get out of the predatorial financial system that has been imposed on them, which is also kind of hijacking some of their political decision-making bodies, causing capital and brain drain for decades. That is a very difficult task, I know, a task which China is undertaking itself domestically and find it very challenging. And I also think that this problem is is universal, by the way.、Um, that many developing countries, their wealthy elites, their interests are bound to this assets that are tied to the U.S. dollar or U.S.-led financial system. Without offering them an alternative option, it is difficult to unshackle their political decision body away and help them to become more independent. Outside of that, China needs to maintain, if not increase, trade with Latin American countries, help it to achieve higher level of energy independence, and help develop modern infrastructures. Of course, my South American friends can also tell me what they think about how China should help South America in the coming years and decades. And is this professor correct or not? Is military something that you guys need at the moment? I am not too sure. So tell me what you think. That being said, though, in terms of China's global strategy at the moment, South America is really not that high up the priority list because it's too far away. China should focus on keeping Southeast Asia stable and try to help countries in South and Southeast Asia against U.S. political muddling. And regime change operation. Also, China should increase economic ties and continue to develop cooperation in a win-win situation. In terms of military power projection, 
China's current aim is to be able to project power into Africa and Middle East and have logistic ports along the way. So that is already under action. In terms of military power projection, China's current aim is to be able to project power into Africa and Middle East and have logistic ports along the way. That is already a work in progress. So if I have to rate geopolitical independence of states, to me, Southeast Asia is already relatively independent and China in that sense should focus on unshackling the Middle East and Africa, help those countries in those regions to become more independent in the long run. I know there's a certain dilemma here, okay? On the one hand, China understands that it seems impossible to help Africa and Middle East to become more independent without getting involved militarily, either by backing regional states military or getting involved directly. However, China needs to take cautious steps to avoid provoking major conflict, which might end up harming those regions' long-term prosperity or harming China's own position and reputation. If China is there to battle imperial colonialism, then it shouldn't let the process turn China into a colonial power at the end. Well, let me know what you guys think about what Professor Chen said here in his interview. And I'll see you guys in the next video.